Development Network webinar. Our topic today is huddles and case conferences. And we selected this topic because there's so much talk now about caring for patients with complex medical and social needs. And we are seeing in the field that one way that uh, teams are better communicating with one another, communicating across institutional boundaries and better communicating even within institutional boundaries is through case conferences and huddles where they talk about patient needs. So we wanted to bring to you today uh, what I think are some innovative approaches to improving communication through these methods. And let me just forward the slide. A few logistical comments. Uh, the session will be recorded, and we will send out a link to the recording to everybody who registered for this webinar. We'll send both the link to the recording as well as the slides that you're seeing today so that you can share the recording and then you can dig a little bit deeper into the slides. I'm sure we always get many questions about whether or not the slides will be shared. So you don't have to go searching for the post. We will push it out to your email address that you use to register for the webinar. To ask a question, uh, please use the chat function that you may need to display by selecting chat at the top right corner. You can chat to all participants so that we can see your question. If you uh, have a logistical issue, you can just chat to the host and we'll try and help you solve that. So we have two great speakers today. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Jason Cunningham, who is a family physician and also medical director of West County Health Centers. West County Health Centers are an FQHC serving patients in Western Sonoma County. He's been the champion for West County's clinical redesign toward a transformed delivery system and has enjoyed the challenges and opportunities in rethinking primary care. We're really excited to have a representative from West County um, on the call today. They've really become a thought leader and an innovator in the new healthcare environment and have really effectively demonstrated the potential of a dynamic primary care delivery model built on relational team-based care, which you'll hear more about in Jason's presentation. We're also very lucky to have Lisa Penny on the phone. Lisa Penny currently serves as the team leader and social worker for the Veterans Administration, Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System Emergency Department, and the particular program is the HPACT, Homeless Patient Aligned Care Team. In this role, Lisa is responsible for maintaining clinic operations, providing direct patient care to ensure veterans have access to medical and mental health services with an emphasis on finding appropriate housing and resources to secure independent living. Previously, Lisa served five years as the Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom Case Manager at the Greater LA VA. She received her MSW and Master's in Public Administration at USC. So first we're going to kick off uh, with Jason's presentation. And let me pass it all. All right. I can move it too, all right. So I'm Jason Cunningham. I'm the Medical Director at West County Health Centers. And uh, I was going to talk a little bit about a particular part of our care delivery, care delivery redesign and why we got there and how it looks, and very interested in questions oh during it um, if they come up, and otherwise we'll have questions at the end. So West County Health Centers is made up of now four primary care sites, three listed here because I didn't update my slide, but we have a site in Western Sonoma County in Occidental and Guerneville and Sebastopol. We also have dental and mental health services, a teen clinic, which is really our best medical home because it's run by teens, a labor center outreach, and a wellness center. We have about 15,000 patients now. Back in 2013, we had about 13,000. Our budget now is around 15 million, uh, was around 12 million, and most of it comes from patient fees. Um, about actually 170 employees, um, but um, we have a lot of part-time staff, particularly part-time providers. And we have uh, full staff of mental health, uh, behavioral health, and we actually have two navigators uh, within our system. This is a slide I always put up there because we worked very hard at this. We feel like it, it's a primary care is a team-based sport and we need to make sure that we uh, fully staff it. We have a one to one and a half uh, provider to MA ratio. 
We have one-to-one -one nurses. Everybody asked my executive director how the heck to do that. I think this is, I think nurses are one of our most important assets in primary care, and we have fully um, invested in them for that reason. And then we have uh, front office uh, to provide a ratio of one to one and a half. Back in 2006, this is our redesign um, goal, um, that everybody gets this long-term, relational, accessible, team-based care. That's kind of the medical home concept. And then we need to start looking at subpopulations to better care for them. So we have care, care management and care coordination, primarily done by our navigators. By our, by our navigators and our medical assistants, and those patients who are not doing well within certain disease sets um, are managed by RNs. And then within that, there's a subset of very high-risk, high, risk, high um, utilizers, and that's who we call our high-risk case management. And um, we did this because of this. We think primary care needs to align itself with, with where the future is going, and I think this is where we're all seeing the burning platform. We're just spending a ton of money on health care, and we think primary care has the ability to affect that, um, but it's through the messy human relationship kind of stuff. And so if we can't change our system even before the um, funding changes, then we're not going to be ready for that shift um, of value uh, into our system. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, we're seeing huge expenses in our care. Uh, and I put this on here not because it's just a funny slide, but because most of our work is focused now on hospitalization, transition care, and decreasing utilization. Back uh, two and a half, three years ago, uh, CCI funded an, 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 a grant for us uh, partnering with our uh, Medicaid health plan, partnership health plan. Uh, looking at high cost, high utilizers, and being able to shift that. Um, we did invest in our nurses, invest in the concept of complex case management, both for behavioral health and RN case management. But this is where we really started putting kind of the meat on the bones and really started looking at what does our process look, looks like. Um, and the, the concept was that we were going to get our 100 most um, expensive patients within Partnership Health Plan, pick 50 of them, and look at the cost um, 12 months prior to our um, starting those patients in the program and 12 months afterwards, uh, whole, whole cost of care, and see if we can make any difference. And we got $100,000 to do that. And so this is a way for us to start looking at different ways of funding. Uh, we have been very um, uh, moved by this article at Tulaguande back a number of years ago, put up this hotspotters, and really started us thinking about how we approach these high utilizers. I think most of us who are doing this kind of work are not focusing anymore on specifically looking at how we improve the diabetes or improve CHF medications. We're really looking at very different uh, reasons for patients to be high utilizers. Tend to be middle to uh, upper age. They tend to have complex issues in addition to something else like addiction, homelessness, some other big social determinant that tends to drive these patients to not use the system appropriately. So we are very moved by this and very moved by the concept that these are kind of the relational, we call it messy human relationships. These are things that are not things that are algorithmic. They are getting to know people and figuring out what triggers them and what allows them to improve their care. So it's true relational care and I think where primary care really has a forte in being able to move this in the different direction. This is actual uh, um, uh, ad, I uh, think outside the box um, for this cremation center. I thought that was kind of cute. Um, but the reality is we can't do things as we used to do them. The concept of trying to get these people who are spending five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars in a year and just say, well, they're non-compliant, they're not coming into our office for 20 minutes, that's not going to be the answer. It's trying to think outside the box and really thinking as a, as a team, how can we approach these patients differently? And um, so uh, California Healthcare Foundation, uh, it was almost six years ago now, uh, offered us an opportunity to participate in ideation with a group called IDEO. And when we were thinking about redesigning our care team approach to these high utilizers, this work that we did with IDEO really um, became transformative for us on how we actually do our team-based care. Um, they wanted us to participate. They brought a number of uh, some cool people together to kind of learn about their process of ideation, and we spent uh, two days with them uh, looking at it. And I was very moved on the process itself, and you'll see why it made a difference for us for um, using these, uh, approaching these patients. 
So IDEO, if you don't know IDEO, they're one of the cooler organizations out there. Um, they do uh, new product development, ideation, and innovation for everybody, uh, from space shuttle to government to AT&T to the Mac. Uh, they developed and helped develop the first mouse, um, all sorts of stuff. And Google IDEO um, shopping cart video, I thought it was a really nice, um, it's about a 25-minute uh, YouTube video um, that, um, that really shows their process and actually something we use as a training model for our case conferences. Um, so what I got to do with IDEO is learn about their process and learn about their culture and how they created the culture to think differently. And what in, in, uh, impressed me was that they have a way of approaching new thinking. So if they're thinking outside the box, a company comes to them and says, I want to approach customer service differently or I want a different product, they have a very specific way of approaching that that's the same for any product they're developing. It's the process of ideation, a process of thinking outside the box uh, that they taught us, which goes into you need to understand who you're dealing with and why they're asking for it. So that empathy, you starting to have to cluster and figuring out how you're defining your product. You have to think outside the box. You kind of have to have messy craziness going on, start getting your prototypes and testing it. And the other thing that I found in that experience and every time that I look at these ideation firms, they have a very flat culture. The concept that the CEO, the CMO does not have the best ideas. You need to put the people in the room who have ideas to reflect on them and then you iterate on that. So if somebody has a good idea, somebody else may have an iteration of that good idea and that's where these cool outside the box um, happens. In our, in our medical model, we oftentimes think the provider has all the answers or when we're doing structure change in our systems, we think the CMO or the executive team. The reality is if we can flatten that out and get ideas from the medical assistants, from the frontline staff, we'll probably have the best ideas out there. And when we're thinking about these patients who are really different and really um, trying to really think how we can align with their um, needs in a different way, it really is the information from the medical assistants, the front office, the behaviorist, the ED doc, the social worker. Those are oftentimes the most insightful interactions that make a difference in how we do things. So we have to set up our culture differently to be able to glean those outside the box um, ideas. So one of uh, so as we picked our 50 patients uh, back to this uh, grant that we got, uh, we identified um, uh, the patients we felt like would be the most amenable to change that were our high cost outliers. Our nurses then um, did a home visit, which took, takes somewhere between an hour and a half and three hours, where you're basically going out to their environment and understanding them better. We have a intake form that's you know really long, includes a spiritual assessment and a home-based assessment, education assessment, drug use. They tend to kind of be watching what are they seeing, what does their house look like, who's around, and they basically are kind of our information information gatherers. The same thing that IDEO does, they send people out into the field. They really try to figure out just get information and get clues to how things may work. And then we put everybody in a case conference, and the first case conference is two hours to orient them on culture and what we're wanting to do. Then after that, everybody gets an hour and a half case conference for every patient in the beginning. Um, this is our most costly um, uh, part of the innovation here. Um, it means we block out uh, provider time, we block out MA time. We actually have this in our budget now. It's nice to have that grant, but we feel like this is so important that we actually have put this in our budget for those patients that are high cost. Um, basically, you need to get everybody in the room that makes sense. The people who are in the room are the people who are on their care teams or front office medical assistant provider. And um, if the patient already has an existing relationship with mental health or behavioral health, they're in there. But some behavioral health or mental health is in that room no matter what, even if they don't have an established relationship. And then anybody that makes sense. So we had one patient, for instance, that was homeless that had a strong relationship with the police uh, that they actually kind of um, brought him in, them into their, him into their fold and help them the, um, interact with him, and so we actually brought the police chief and the social worker from the county and the ED social worker at the hospital. And so anybody that we felt like would gain insight into this, we brought we bring them into that case conference. Hey, Jason. And this is what, yeah. Um, there's a question I just wanted to share with you, and also I'd actually encourage other folks to respond as well. But. Um, you know, from your perspective, you had just said that you incorporate this into your budget because you think it's important. Uh, do you have a perspective, and I'll just share the question with you, about what changes mm -hmm. are needed to continue to finance this type of care? What yeah. changes are needed in Medi-Cal? 
Yeah, so I, I think uh, most of the Medi-Cal uh, managed care plans, uh, I think a lot of where we're going to this value-based system, um, you know, 2703 funding for the state is going to focus on how do you decrease the utilization. In some way, we're going to either get a per member per month or some sort of higher cost for each individual interaction so we can pay for this. In my mind, it's staffing, and this is where I think that we in primary care really have to change the way we're approaching it. You're not going to be able to do this in five years and then assume you're going to get the results that you're looking for. So I would say what we need to do is invest in the type of people that are going to make a difference, and we need to move away from the interaction with providers as being the sole um, contributors to their outcomes. So nurses, coaches, um, social workers, community health workers, trying to figure out how to fund those positions in your existing budget so that you can play in this space as we move forward. Um, one of our uh, innovative providers said, well, why don't we uh, teach in-home support workers to be our community health workers, for instance. There's ways for us to use existing dollars in order for us to be able to start looking at how do we change our staffing. But in the future, we need to move our staffing towards a different model of this kind of high touch, particularly for this subset of patients. But honestly, if you look at behavior change, that's what we're really looking at primary care anyway, so we need to start staffing our systems different. And I'm going to assume that our Medi-Cal managed plans and other places are going to start paying us differently, but here's where the rubber meets the road. We need to start staffing that now and training our staff with motivational interviewing and active listening and all these other things in order for us to, to reap that benefit in the future. Great. Thanks for that perspective. And I encourage other sure. folks to add questions in the, or add um, answers and or questions in the chat function. Great. So this is what our case conferences look like. Um, we try to make it a messy space where there's creative, there's something about kinetics where you need to be up and walking around. We we have all the you know, Play-Doh and other things, so people become creative. We actually have a facilitator trained to facilitate the meeting that is trained in the concept of bringing out those um, people who don't necessarily talk. There's a power dynamic in our social structure in the healthcare that the provider is the boss, and so really having that person really ask the medical assistant, ask the front office, make sure everybody has a voice. Uh, but this is kind of the concept that we're not doing things right right now because the patient's having $500,000 last year, so how do we really think differently? Uh, let's see. Uh, so the first half hour is information gathering. We're just putting everything on the table. This is mostly what the nurse does when they go out. They take, you know, notes and notes and notes, and they're just kind of giving a reflection on what they found. Uh, and then everybody takes notes on sticky paper as they are um, listening. So what comes up for them, it doesn't have to be something specific about the medical care. It might be a thought they had, this person needs more social interaction, what about a dog, you know, that kind of stuff. All patients are trying to do is a stream of consciousness that they're just writing down as they're thinking about things. That takes about a half an hour. Then we have a narrative writing session, so we're actually trying to rethink how we're approaching it. So um, the first uh, 15 minutes is just writing your thoughts uh, about what happened and what you experienced when you were getting all the information as people got to know the patient in a different way. And then the next 15 minutes, or, uh, excuse me, first five minutes is that, and then the next five minutes is from the patient's perspective as we try to shift our focus towards doing things to patients, towards empathy and trying to understand what the patients would need to do. Uh, that writing session helps a lot. And then we kind of share out those issues. And that actually was an, an addition about uh, three or four case conferences in has been a very important part of this kind of shaping the culture. Then we have this 20 minutes of brainstorming. Uh, we use a product called NovaMind, which is an electronic version of uh, mind mapping. These are our categories that we start putting those pieces of paper. So as the patients are start, or the staff is starting to write down that stream of consciousness, they start basically virtually putting it up on: Is it a medical issue? Is it a behavior or social issue? Is it self-management? Is it spiritual? Is it medical home connection? And so we start grouping these um, kind of consciousness, and that's and that's kind of aggregating and grouping kind of. The, uh, the things that we're talking about so we can start focusing on a few of them. So this is what it kind of looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, spiritual, do they want to have a connection to some bigger, um, you know, uh, society? Do they want to travel, something bigger than them, medical home, reaching out? So it's kind of these areas that people are kind of focusing on, and, and most of it has little to do with the medical interaction and more to do with the connections, the, the worth, the why, uh, why we're here, that kind of stuff. And then we take um, that mind map and we actually take those little dots and we vote. Each, each person has, a, has two votes and then we stick them up on the screen and the most votes gets the deep dive on what we want to focus on solutions. 
And so this is kind of the deep dime of a nudge uh, with using the concept that if you have two parallel lines going in the same direction for a long period of time, they're not going to uh, diverge or come together. But if you nudge that line, one of the lines, just a little bit over time, it makes a big difference. So we're not looking at fixing and dramatically changing. We're looking at areas that we can really nudge patients towards a different direction, and over time it makes a big difference. And our experience has actually be, has been that actually it doesn't take very long. Six months to a year you see dramatic improvement if you kind of look at these areas to nudge. But you can kind of get an idea of the things that we're looking at to kind of um, have a deep dive on. After that, we kind of have the, the adult conversation about what are we actually going to do about it and who does it. And in our model, it's not the RN care manager who's just um, explicitly able to do this. Uh, oftentimes, it's the front office um, reaching out. It's sending letters. It's, um, it's doing more home visits. It's reaching back out to the patient on these specific things and asking them what do they think. It's reaching out to caregivers. And oftentimes, that's done not by the nurse but other members of the team. It's just that the nurse is collaborating and coordinating it. So for us, nudging is oftentimes trust building, motivational interviewing, barrier reduction, self-management coaching, addiction management, care coordination, health, um, mental health support, rethinking access, uh, frequent touches. I'm secret, sitting next to a, a new staff of ours who um, is uh, brought on because we got a HRSA grant around addiction and, and really working at it. Most of these patients have major, major social stressors that are really creating barriers. And so moving one step at a time rather than thinking we're moving up, um, you know, we're already running. We're using baby steps here. And um, it usually is this kind of stuff. It's, it's warm touches. It's the interaction that happens where you're doing frequent calls, frequent touches, and then we're frequently coming back to work as a team to see how we're moving forward, how is it going, what do we need to do differently. So that case conference is really setting us up for um, ongoing interaction uh, that moves forward. So that, I thought that I'd put that out there um, for everybody to kind of look at as a concept um, as we move forward with some of the other discussions and we can take questions. Um, one of the questions to the participants is, um, so you put that I was actually, that was a question I was posing to participants. I'd yeah. love to hear back from folks about how your approach is similar or different from West County's. Just wanted to hear a little bit more about how the approaches, what the approaches are like in the audience. So if you could shoot an answer to that in the chat box, that would be great. And I'll continue to take, I do have some questions that went directly to me that I'll kind of start to curate and we can gather them at the end. But I think now we can probably turn it over to Lisa. So Jason, I, you just have to drop the ball to Lisa. Okay, here we go. So um, one question, Jason uh, and Lisa, before you start talking, is how often do you case do you conduct a case conference on each uh, of your patients? Yeah. So we do the first hour and a half case conference. We do it with um, uh, each patient for an hour and a half, and then we do a 45-minute uh, review around six months. Um, but any new patient gets that same thing. So we redo kind of everybody in the room uh, every six months. But usually that first one, that hour and a half. Um, is done just at intake. Um, and we found that we have kind of mini case conferences. We bring these people up at our care team meetings every month and our huddles when they're coming in. But this formal bringing everybody together happens every six months, and the first one is the hour and a half one. Okay, I got a couple more questions that came directly to me. The NovaMind, is that, could you talk a little bit more about that? Is that a sure. software package or? Yeah, it's a software. I mean, the concept that IDEO would work at is you kind of have to be up there putting crazy weird thoughts out there. So it's if you've ever experienced kind of an innovation conference or brainstorming, people write notes on a piece of sticky tab and you're putting it, sticking it on the wall, and then somebody has to group those into areas of focus. So oftentimes that's the job of the facilitator. Uh, there's a thing called mind mapping, which is uh, a, a software package. There's a lot of different uh, software packages that do that. It just allows you to do that virtually. Uh, and so it kind of, the facilitator will, somebody will call out, uh, they need a new dog. And well, that goes into the spiritual part. So somebody's kind of putting it in there. NovaMind, the one we use, is a really slick one. It allows you to kind of move things around and kind of dive in, create new mind maps around it. And the reason we figured about, wanted to use the virtual is we actually use WebEx. And so sometimes we bring in people who are not on site to participate in the brainstorming. So for them to be able to see that on a WebEx and shared screen allows us to have people participate who are not in the room itself. It's cheap, too. It's not an expensive software. Two more questions. 
Uh, you mentioned that there, you have a trained facilitator who is good at kind of drawing out individuals who are not participating in the case conference. What did that training look like for that person? So when it was picking the right person, the person was has to be somewhat smiling and uh, good as an outward kind of interaction, and then being able to kind of discern. And so we we did a really you know careful assessment of who could be doing that type of work personality-wise, and then we spent an hour and a half training them on kind of concept of the mind map, concept of the um, kind of the facilitated process, and then we have kind of a monthly check-in that has mentoring associated with it. And um, all of them are, at this point, our front office managers, and so they're a little higher functioning, they've done some management, they've got maturity, um, but also they're not uh, providers, they're not, uh, you know, trained, um, you know, master's degree or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And if if there are clinics on the phone who would like to adopt your approach um, of being more kind of creative, what would you recommend if they haven't gone through IDEO training and haven't mm -hmm. created this process flow or design themselves? Mm -hmm. I mean, I in my mind, the process is the creating the culture and then creating the space to be able to have this outside of the box thinking. And there are a lot of, most of us have gone to conferences and other things where we do some sort of breakout and, and that type of thing. And there are companies out there that can train you or you can at least experience it. Um, but honestly, um, watching that uh, shopping cart video will give you an idea of why you're doing it. And then um, uh, there, on the back of the Incredibles, there's, uh, uh, the disc two of the Incredibles uh, talks about um, the process that that creative team used um, to create culture around it. So it's in my mind, it's really thinking as a team around creating a culture of the, whatever process you're using around thinking outside the box, how you're going to do it, as much as the how you do it. I suspect there'll be iterations of this type of work in a lot of different ways, but in some way it's you got to get people thinking outside of the, the narrow and have to have some sort of process of getting them there, a creative thinking, bringing them out of their existing work, having space to time to do it. You've dedicated, you know, um, time away from their busy lives. You've, you know, invested in that. That kind of stuff needs to happen. Great, thank you. And I have seen that shopping cart video, so what we can do is send out a link to it when we send out the slides to folks. Great. Great, so Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa. I work at the Veterans Hospital here in um, Los Angeles. I am the um, team lead for the HVAC team, which is a um, homeless patient aligned care team. And what we are, we are co-located in the um, emergency department. And the, you know, the goal of our team is to work with veterans that are homeless, at risk of being homeless, that are chronic, um, you know, util high utilizers of the emergency department. Um, and so some of the services that we offer is, you know, we take really a systems approach. We try and address, you know, the medical, the mental health, their housing, you know, any type of preventative care, and really focus on removing barriers to, you know, get veterans connected to, you know, the specialty clinics and everything that, um, all the services that they need that will help them get to, you know, wellness and independent living. And that can be, you know, very challenged with such a, you know, a large system like the Veterans Hospital. How we got started was Dr. Um, Rishi Manchanda. He is our um, director here. He's the medical director of um, all of the HPACs. And he actually has this really amazing TED talk. Um, it's called Upstream Doctors. If you're um, interested in learning more about our process more in depth, it's really great. And the idea is, is that, you know, it's, it's an upstream approach. So it's seen more than just symptoms. And really, you know, the idea is that health begins where people live, work, and play. And so, you know, what we try and do as a team and with our HPAC approach is to mobilize systems, you know, to connect patients to, you know, the resources that are needed. You know, right now when the veterans come in, you know, they'll see either a specialist in the ED or a specialty clinic or they go to a primary care provider that focuses, you know, on chronic, you know, some of their chronic conditions. But the part that's missing is the part that is, you know, addressing the issues that the environmental part of it, what is causing all of these conditions. And that's kind of like where we come in. We look at the whole um, system um, of the person, and we try and not focus so much on just the symptoms, but, you know, what, what is the environment? What is causing those sy symptoms? Really taking more of a, a preventative um, approach. 
Um, the complexity of the veterans that we see, as you can see, it's pretty complex. We see, you know, we will handle as many as, you know, seven, um, you know, different conditions within one uh, visit. Usually the first visit is the longest visit. It can take as much to an hour and a half. And in that whole hour and a half, they will meet with the whole team. And at the end of each visit, what makes, uh, well, this gives you a sense here of the percentage of, you know, what are some of the conditions that they, they are presenting here. And the two things that we have found that have really worked with this population is usually our patient huddle and our care management tracking tool. And the reason that that has been so helpful because it really assists the veteran in getting connected to, not moving, there we go. It's getting the veteran connected to everybody on the team. It's a real, um, you know, team effort. We have a, a social worker, the provider, the LVN, the clerk, the case manager. We even have um, a lawyer that's here. We have a partnership with the medical uh, legal partnership that we developed with inner city law. That's been really a great um, asset to have. Um, and it's been really helpful with getting, you know, veterans their access to their, you know, um, social security service connection claims, all of that. So again, it's the whole idea is just using this chronic care model, you know, and helping the veterans get access to everything that they need and not just focusing on their, um, on their symptoms. The um, part of the huddles that we have is really one of the most, I think, important parts of what uh, we do. At the end of each visit, um, the provider will call us in and we will all go in as a team and we will go over what comes next. What is the follow-up for the veteran? Does he need, is it housing? What medical consults they may need? Getting connected to, um, you know, a health coach? Do they need to follow up on a TB test for housing? Um, whatever they may need, we're, we're gonna document that at the end of each visit. We're gonna, you know, ask, veteran has the opportunity to ask questions to each of us. And that way we know going forward that whenever the veteran may come back, no matter who he sees, we're all gonna know what's going on. So it's not, you know, it's not separate. And um, it's really been such an effective tool because on some days in clinic when we're so busy and maybe we have a veteran who, you know, same veteran comes in every week and it's maybe just a medication refill and maybe the provider will be, you know, do the um, medication refill really quick and won't huddle. The veteran will say, hey, aren't we supposed to huddle? So we know that they really do appreciate that. They really feel connected to us and with that, they, you know, they stay connected to, you know, their medical care. They're attending their appointments more often. And, you know, whenever there's an issue, um, you know, getting them connected to one of the clinics, they know they can come see each of us. It's not like, oh, the social work's not here, the RN isn't here. We're all here as one, and we make it very, you know, clear to them. They can come see any of us at any given time, and it's um, really been a great tool for the veterans. Yeah, another thing that we use is something called the Complex Care Management Tool, and this is where we document. So after the huddle, everything that went over in the huddle is documented in our case management tracking tool. So there could be up to five, seven, eight things that we may have to do for follow-up, and every single one of those will get listed um, in the care management tracking tool. So we um, have follow-up. So every morning when we come into clinic, we will print out the list of our tasks for the day, and everyone will, you know, again, we work as a team, and so if the RN has maybe a lot of scheduled appointments, and the social worker will help take on some of the tasks, and we really just we huddle every morning to see which veterans need what. We go over this tool every morning, and it's a way to keep track because it's it's some of these veterans with all the you know complex um, issues that they have. It's really the only way to to monitor that we're doing what we're supposed to do for them. Um, this is a little bit talks a little bit about our um, facility um, results, and it shows that you know we start off with one HPAC, which was as mentioned, located in the um, emergency department. We've now grown to um, five. We have another building that also is full of, we have um, four HPAC teams there. And, you know, with the number of HPACs that we have teams growing, we have seen a decrease in ED utilization. Um, there are obstacles, though. Even though we have this system with, you know, the huddles and the care management tool, and we are, you know, able to you know, tightly wrap, you know, the veteran and make sure they're getting, you know, all the services they need. We do still have a lot of obstacles as far as um, probably the biggest one that we have is um, inpatient discharges. Um, veterans come in, they're homeless, and then, you know, they're discharged to nowhere. So we really have had to work and educate a lot um, the inpatient teams as far as, you know, 
letting them know that we're here, and so there's a warm hand up to us. Another thing we found is that, you know, with a lot of the different specialty clinics, if there's no phone number, which a lot of these homeless veterans, you know, they don't have phones, if there's no phone number and they can't get a hold of you to schedule, you know, the consult there is, you know, gets canceled, so there's no appointments are made. So one of the things that we've done for that is we have our HVACs, we have our 24-hour phone, and veterans that don't have a phone, they get our phone number. And so the clinics will call us and we will schedule their appointments and, you know, the homeless veterans know that they need to come check in several times a week with us so we can give them their appointments. And we've had a, and a great success rate with that. You know, the veterans know to come in and we'll, we'll print out their list sometimes several times a week. And so even though they don't have a phone, they're still being able to get connected to their um, appointment. Um, another issue that we have is still something that's challenging is that some of these veterans, especially those that are chronically homeless, getting them connected to housing. You know, you need to be medically or psychiatrically stable to a lot to go into a lot of them, but where do you go and become medically and psychiatrically stable? It's hard to do that when you're on the streets. But yet, having this model where we have, you know, the case management tool and the huddle, and, you know, we really connect with the veterans and they really feel like, you know, they're, they're part of a team, we have seen, you know, really great success with these, um, with the veterans being able to, even though they're homeless, still coming and showing up for appointments, still doing, you know, medication management, um, you know, check in with the nurse a few days a week or the social worker a few days a week and getting them to a place where they are able to transition into um, housing, but which is, all, all, of course, the ultimate um, goal. And our next steps going forward is just, you know, using this care management tracking tool and team huddle at multiple um, sites. It's already, we have it probably the, over 20 sites throughout the United States that they're doing the HPACs and you know, hopefully we'll keep building on that. And that is all. Great, thank you. Lisa, I'm curious, uh, if folks have questions, please put them in the chat function. I see uh, one so far, I did, and I did receive another one. Uh, one of the questions I received was, do you still feel you need to have a case conference similar to what Jason described without the patient in addition to the huddle? Do those serve different functions? No, I don't think so because we we go over the list as a team in the morning. So everybody that's like scheduled for the day, we go we go over it, we do a real quick brief, you know, okay, so-and-so's coming in, what's the follow-up, what is this? So we, we do that on a daily basis um, anyway, so we don't mm -hmm. set aside any separate time necessarily like down the road or we, I'll just meet as a team because we're we're constantly all day long, you know, going through the case management log, going over the scheduled people for the day. Even though, you know, with our population, we have a large group of walk-ins, um, and even with the walk-ins before they, you know, come in, if we all get together as a team and we'll discuss, okay, they're here as a walk-in for this. Um, what else do we have for follow-up? What do we have from last time? So we're always in that you know, huddle minds that we're always getting together as a team with every veteran. You know, no veteran ever just comes in, sees the doctor and leaves. It's always as a team. There's always conversation before they meet with the provider and there's always conversation after they meet with the provider. Great, and I'm sorry if you said this, I was trying to uh, field a couple logistical questions. Do you have a way for patients to walk out with an after visit summary that summarizes what the huddle is? What was decided in the huddle? Yes, they get, so when the uh, veteran leaves there, um, they get a, uh, a paper, a printout, with their okay. next set of appointments and what needs to happen next. Got it, okay. And then I think this is a question for both Lisa and Jason. Uh, there's a question here about what is the minimum amount of patients that providers in your organization see in an eight-hour workday? I think, um, Jorge, you're probably trying to wrap your head around the ability to devote resources and time to the case conferences? Yeah, I would say on average the providers see anywhere between maybe um, 10 and 20 per day, probably on the average about 13. Got it. And Jason, what about at West County? Jason, if you're talking, I think your phone might be on mute. Oh, here we go. Sorry, that you can hear me now. Yeah. We we have uh, two, three-hour and twenty-minute shifts rather than four-hour shifts. Um, 
and uh, we budget two and a half patients per hour, so it ultimately ends up around 16 and a half to 17 patients at baseline. Um, and um, people still ask, well, that's actually at the lower end of productivity. We don't pay our staff a lot. Um, we own all our own buildings, and we have kind of militantly wanted to make sure that our staffing and our nurses were prioritized in this kind of model because we don't have our nurses doing efficiency. They're not taking histories. They're doing this messy human out, outpatient stuff. So, um, so that's what we do. Great. And then I know um, uh, from Janice, Lisa, there's a question about the complex care management tracking tool. Uh-huh. Is that something that was developed proprietary by the VA? Um, so it started actually as just we, when we first um, started, we were actually just using Excel. And then that um, kind of evolved into um, another database that was created. And now the one that we're using was actually was created for, um, at the Portland uh, VA Medical Center. It's something that they use with their um, cancer patients. And um, so we just actually started using that last week. It's similar to the ones that we were using before, but it's just, um, it's a little bit different. Simple. I would, I would say to that. Okay. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I was gonna say, I think that the actual managing this kind of stuff is what Lisa's talking about. What do you actually do and how do you coordinate it? Having somebody who's in charge of that, everybody needs some sort of tool that you can keep all these balls in the air. It's really a, it's different than the patient just coming in to manage. It's how do you do things in between? How do you make sure people got their stuff done? It's really a different type of skill than we have currently in our healthcare delivery. And Jason, does West County have a similar type of tool that they use, that you use? We, we put it in our EMR through tracking. Um, there's action fields, and then we have an Excel sheet for these very specific sheets or patients um, that I look at outcome data. And so uh, we measure PHQ-9, SF-12, PAM, and some other things that we want to measure just for outcome data. And all that kind of gets stuck in um, an Excel sheet. But um, what the actual staff does is done within our EMR. Got it. So your comment about outcome data uh, is relevant to Bruce Burlock's question about evidence and um, evidence of impact. And do you, uh, what's your, what is your data showing in terms of care or utilization impact? So uh, we're uh, working with part of that grant I was talking to you about through CCI. We're working with Partnership Health Plan and Bob Moore. If anybody knows Bob, he's, you know, wonderful uh, data uh, person, and he took uh, partnership data, utilization data, uh, whole cost data, and looked at the impact of our program and two other programs, and he recognized that there's a significant regression to the mean for a lot of these patients. If you do anything and start measuring these patients, like, likely a lot of them will improve regardless of what we do. And so he wanted to have a control group that he took that regression out. And so he looked at, uh, I think, five other clinics and picked their high-cost patients, had they, him identify um, those patients after a year, and actually took out the um, total cost care and subtracted what he thought would be basically a similar size to our patient population. And even within that very conservative estimate, our, our ROI was like four, um, and, um, and that's only after six months. So he's actually extended that, uh, asked his board, and uh, gave us another grant for $150,000 to look at another uh, kind of basic same cohort of patients and looking to roll that out across partnership health plan because we think this type of work, he thinks this type of work is going to have a return on investment for whole cost utilization. But we also looked at SF12, you know, patient self-assessment of their own health, uh, PHQ-9, uh, this thing called patient activation measure, and noticed that for the most part there was an improvement. It's such individual work, and so um, it's hard to look at trends without a huge N, but um, certainly an improvement with all those uh, results as well. And Lisa, what about the VA? Are they evaluating the outcomes of, of HPAC? They are evaluating the outcomes. Um, we just had our building 402 open, which, you know, consists, of, like I said, of four uh, HPACs, and that just opened about two months ago. So it's still new in the process. So that's what's different about, you know, um, what they're doing over there is just, you know, ours, our HPAC is located in the ED. So we get, you know, a lot of the veterans that are presenting to the emergency department. That was kind of like our goal, well, how we can do to assist the ED with lowering the um, 
you know, veterans that have high utilization rates. So that, that has shown great success there. And so, we're, you know, time will tell with 402. Like I said, it's just about two months open, but they are monitoring, they are monitoring that. Hopefully we'll have some, you know, results soon on that to show access to care and improvement and, you know, just continuity of care. And do either of you, there's a question here about medication access and uh, affordability or non-covered medications, uh, particularly if individuals are uninsured, the affordability issue. Uh, I don't know if that's relevant to the VA, but maybe uh, Jason and Lisa, you could comment on how you might deal. Well, for us, mm -hmm. it's, you know, veterans here, I mean, it's, it's based on a means test. So if a veteran can't afford to pay, then they don't. So it's a little bit different here. Yeah. We, uh, medications is one of the, certainly one of the barriers to a lot of patients, not just getting the medications, but taking them. And so uh, we do have kind of a whole program. We use 403B or, uh, yeah, 403B um, uh, pharmacies uh, and then um, have a whole staff that does um, prior authorizations and, um, and uh, drug uh, assistance programs. But uh, we have some of our outcomes, you know, went one this great story where this lady just didn't take her evening medicine, would remember to take the morning one, but her evening medicine didn't work. And so the patient would come in and the staff made a necklace with a little um, really cool looking pendant on it that was to put her medicine in. And they would put it in her necklace for her to remember to take as one of the outcomes. So a lot of it was kind of the creative use of our patients actually picking these up and using it. I would think for the homeless population, there's tons of barriers to actually just kind of following through and so forth. Yeah, Great another, example. Well, another barrier too that we see is you know a lot of veterans they don't have access, those that don't have access to phones, you know, they don't have access to to their family and communicating with them. And so again, they use our phone as that. So like throughout the day, we'll you know be fielding a lot of calls. Veterans know they can give their, you know, their friends, their family, whoever, you know, our HPAC number, and we will relay, you know, the messages to them. So that's something that we're constantly doing as well. Again, keeping the veteran connected not just, you know, to the medical care that they need, but also to their family as well, which we know is, you know, important in helping the veteran, you know, maintain stability and housed and all that good stuff. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I would suggest anybody who's trying to do this work is start getting these stories. I mean, I think if you look at Lisa or my program, you'll find if you ask the staff, there's some tear-jerking stories, and it all has to do with just this kind of high-touch relational care. It's figuring out what that individual patient is struggling with, what the barriers are, so you can creatively create solutions around it. It really is not the this person should just be on this algorithm for blood pressure control. It's much more of these kind of messy stuff that happens. So. And I think yeah, also and working with like the staff where you're at, you know, for us here, like I wrote, is one of the obstacles. It's just, you know, getting buy-in from, you know, employees is because, you know, not everyone is very sympathetic to, to homeless veterans. You know, they just see them as how they see them. And it's, you know, what's important that we have to do is educating, you know, the other clinics and the other providers on, you know, this isn't just a homeless veteran. It's, it's a person. And there's a lot of backstory to how a lot of these people you know, became homeless, and it's just kind of sharing that and really putting a, a face to, to the person. Yeah, Scott asks a really important question about integration with other organizations. Um, how did you, how do you discover and find out about previous client interactions with other community-based organizations? Have you done any client-specific program participation tracking across organizations? So trying to understand if individuals are using other community-based organizations for different types of, quote, care and interacting with them. I can comment quickly on that. I think that's a, a low-hanging fruit for us to move forward kind of in this upstream work. Um, and trying to understand what are the community resources that are available, uh, much less are they actually being um, accessed. We, we do, as our intake, try to understand all the different parts of that person's care team and, and, and beyond just the medical stuff. And then oftentimes we'll make a relational connection out to them or sometimes on a few of our patients uh, we've brought them into the case conferences. But that's where the care coordination and the communication and collaboration happens and it's at that personal level, I think, calling up, making sure everybody knows what's going on, having signed releases, some of that kind of stuff needs to happen. Uh, but I, we have a hard time knowing what, what, what's out there as well, um, so. And Lisa, is this less of an issue for you because you feel you have a comprehensive approach within the VA? 
Uh, we do have a comprehensive approach, but we are constantly, you know, access, you know, utilizing community resources. So, you know, we couldn't, community resources are very helpful and we partnership with a lot of, you know, like the inner city law, that's a huge one, the medical legal partnership, and we do, we do use community resources often. Great. Uh, Bruce uh, had a question kind of about variation, uh, which I'm not completely following, Bruce, but variation in how the teams approach it. And I think you, is there variation in approach or performance among the teams involved? And if so, any lessons? And I think, Bruce, what you might be getting at is whether or not within each of these organizations there's variation in how specific teams might approach uh, this type of care, and I don't know if that's, I'm not sure if that's relevant for your organizations, but I'll let you, I'll let you answer. Yeah. I, I would say strongly, yes, there's variation. It's been a really interesting journey for us on trying to figure out the team dynamic and the personalities and making sure you focus and address those. It has been very interesting when the provider, for instance, really is not into it, the whole case conference becomes flat. Uh, and so there's where this kind of, you have to do a lot of work uh, on these teams to understand why we're doing it, why this is different, how you work on it. It has to do with personality. It has to do with the dynamics of the team. We have actually had some interventions within our teams uh, around kind of building relationships and mending bridges and so forth because it really becomes this very high functioning team and when the teams aren't working well. So I would think that would be the biggest performance difference is just personalities of the members and buy-in, particularly from the providers, but um, getting that voice, that flattening of the organization. So we've done a lot of kind of mentoring and hand-holding on some of our teams around that. Really good question. Lisa, do you see a similar dynamic? Um, I do. I think, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, a team is everything. You have to have the right team. Um, personalities, everyone's is very, can be very special, and you really have to, you have to work together as a team. You have, to, it can be challenging, um, but it's, it's very doable. As long as, you know, everyone is on this, you know, we have the same long-term goals, um, you know, it, it can, it can work. It just, it, it, it takes work. It takes work. A lot of pers different personalities, but um, it's very doable. Great, well that was the final question. Uh, for folks of you, for those of you who are um, gonna log off, if you could just finish the poll. There's some final questions. Uh, it should take you about 10 seconds to answer those three questions on the right-hand side in the polling function. And again, we'll send out the slides and the recording and a link to that YouTube video that kind of uh, demonstrates the design process. And just want to say a big thank you to Jason and Lisa for sharing your really innovative approaches to caring for this population. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.